vision of this temple is always to allow our bright lights to shine in this consciousness of love. And indeed, our beloved Reverend John will lead us in his encouragement this morning. Help me welcome Reverend John the Beloved to the podium. Uh, thank you, Reverend Anne, and good morning, worldwide spiritual family. It is a joy to add my own words of welcome to this morning's Sunday celebration on a bright, sunny Jamaican morning. The Pui's are in full flight, radiant in their beauty, and the Bougainvilleas also are in bloom, and above all, our hearts are aflame with love for all of our brothers and sisters all across the globe who join us in consciousness on this radiant and beautiful Sunday morning. In my younger years, I used to uh, attend a lot of auctions and had great fun. You know, you know at auctions, people get carried away, you know, the, the item isn't worth more than a few hundred dollars, but uh, there are those people who have to have it. And so you can just sit there and watch the prices going up and up and up, way beyond what they may really be worth, because of course the collectors simply have to have it. Going once, going twice. Ah, sold to the gentleman in the green shirt at the back of the room. So one by one, all the antiques on auction were offered. And finally, the auctioneer looked around. Nothing was left. And fixing his eye, his professional eye, upon my friend who was at the auction with me, he said, what am I bid for this fine woman here? That's when she woke up. Thank God, it was only a dream. She didn't have to find out what other people thought she was really worth. But isn't that how we too often measure our self-worth, my friends? By what we believe other people think of us? I know many people create enormous stress for themselves by also holding an unrealistic image of what perfection looks like or should look like. And I know you ladies, many of you fall, fall prey to this particular one because somehow, somewhere along the line in your upbringing and your growing up, you, you were led to believe that you have to be the perfect woman, the perfect wife, the perfect mother, the perfect housekeeper, the perfect cook, the perfect friend, the perfect worker at work, Perfection seems to be demanded of our women in all kinds of amazing ways. And I have many women friends who are stressed out beyond belief because they simply can't reach that level of perfection for which they have been taught they must strive all the days of their life. But it doesn't apply to all women folk only. For most of my young life, growing up in the shadow of a brilliant older brother, I really thought that perfection meant without a flaw. Worse yet, I thought it meant never making a mistake, never hurting another person's feelings, never being at fault for anything, and most of all, being accepted and loved by everyone. <laughs> you may think it's funny now, but when I was six or seven years old and my grandmother who lived with us um, used to tell me all the time. She insisted that every time I was naughty, in other words, every time I fell short of being the perfect child, the perfect second child, by the way, I had driven another nail into the cross through the hands of the Savior, Jesus. So I thought, I really believed that somehow I personally had crucified him. I felt unworthy of love, and it became a, a mantra for me. 
Why can't you be like your, your bigger brother? You know, he's, he always is doing his lessons and reading a book. And of course, I wasn't inclined at all in that direction. I wanted to run and play and climb, climb trees and um, have fun out in nature. And somehow that wasn't okay. What made you an okay little brother was to sit quietly and read for hours and hours, which is something that I don't think I ever learned how to do. And so I thought for a long time that I was imperfect and unworthy of love. And I remember it clearly because in 1981, when I attended my first class here at the Temple of Light with our founding minister, Dr. Elmer Lumsden, it was the very first class and the introductory exercise was to have each person in the room introduce themselves by saying their name and then an adjective that started with, the, with their first initial, you know. So you had Mary the Mary and Peter um, the Perfect and what have you. So I thought, okay, I'll say I'm John the Jocular. But when it came to my time I, I, to introduce myself, I don't know where it came from. And I heard myself saying, I am John the Beloved. And that name has stuck with me and has changed the way I perceive myself and the way I think about myself as a beloved expression of the one presence and the one power that created us all out of itself. And so John the Beloved is really a very special name to me. And it started right here at this church. A lot of people, you know, have shared with me that when they, they first attended this teaching, when they first discovered it, they felt for the first time in their lives that they had, in a sort of strange way, come home. Because they had found a place where they mattered. They found a place where it was okay to be themselves, warts and all. And back to my childhood, I remember getting a sharp look from my mom because there was an old Anglican hymn called, Just As I Am Without One Plea. And I sang, just as I am, without one flea. And my mother didn't think it was very funny, so I got the evil eye. You know that eye that mothers give you when you are being naughty, imperfect, and driving another nail through the palm of the Savior into the wood of the cross. In the opening page of his classic work, The Science of Mind, Dr. Ernest Holmes, founder of this great teaching known as The Science of Mind, welcomes the reader with the following phrase, quote, these lessons are dedicated to the truth which frees man from himself and sets him on the pathway of a new experience which enables him to see through the mist to the eternal and changeless reality. Enables him to see through the mist to the eternal and changeless reality of who and whose we are. Perhaps this is what St. Paul meant in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when he said, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Known by whom, my friends? Known by the master, the creator, the author of your life, the person the entity, the energy, the spirit, the living spirit almighty that created you out of itself in the image of its eternity, of its beauty, of its love, and of its allness. So you see, friends, beyond the basic human need for food and shelter, clothing, and sex, our greatest need is to know that we really matter that we really count for something in life. People try in many ways to achieve this feeling of being valid, laboring under the delusion that if they can only just accumulate enough material wealth, the world will beat a path to their door. They fail to realize that the only way to attain the feeling of being valid and valuable to life is to know beyond a doubt that we matter to life simply because we exist. We matter simply because 
we exist. The late Mother Teresa is quoted as, as saying, and I quote, we ourselves feel that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean. But if that drop was not in the ocean, I think that the ocean would be less because of that missing drop, unquote. Dr. Holmes titled the first four chapters of The Science of Mind, The Thing Itself, The Way It Works, What It Does, and How to Use It. In these chapters, he clearly explains the principles of life and thereby essentially tells us that we matter. Why? Because we are able to accomplish what we accomplish as the perfect creations of a perfect God. We matter not because of anything we have accumulated or will ever accumulate. We matter because the source of our identity is God. As Dr. Holmes puts it in our Declaration of Principles, quote, the highest God and the innermost God, the God that dwells at the very center of your being, the highest God and the innermost God is one and the same God. Although we do not have the power then to change our actual identity, the important thing is to begin to change how we think of ourselves. This is the essence of the transformative work we started in our prisons some eight years ago. And although that work has been suspended because of the pandemic, I am praying daily that it will, we will resume because that course, Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life, has touched so many people and taught them that they matter, that they are not their past, that they are not the mistakes they have made, that they are created by something that knows nothing of the mistakes in their past, that knows only the beauty and the perfection and the goodness that is the truth of their very being. And it's just amazing to sit in a classroom with 10 or 20 men and see the lights going on behind their eyes as for the first time somebody says to them, you matter. You make a difference. You are that drop in the ocean, and without you, the ocean would not be the same. This is such an important lesson to give to our children, my friends, and to, uh, to be sure that we, we tell it to ourselves on a daily basis. You see, friends, for many of us, and for many of those men in the, in the, that are incarcerated, life is a roller coaster. One day you think of yourself as capable of dealing with life, and the next day you feel totally imprisoned and incapable and hopeless and stymied. One minute we are experiencing the giddy, head-over-heels exhilaration when we meet with success or fall in love, and the next we experience the extreme 20-story drop in energy when someone or something disappoints us or when we ourselves mess up, when we make a mistake. One of the participants in our course at the prison one day said, you know, I, when I lie on my mat at nights and I think about it, what got me in here took a nanosecond. One, one side of my mind was saying, don't do it. And somehow, in a split second, it happened. And here I am for an indefinite period of time. And so, it's such an important lesson for us to, to ponder that we are not the mistakes we have made. We are not the past. We are created by a, a source that is invincible and that there is a part of us that has never been touched by error, by mistakes, by, mistakes, by, by abuse. abuse. By the lie, lie, lie that, that don't, we don't matter, matter and that we that are, we are nothing. nothing. You know, friends, you know, friends this, grace, this grace, this changeless reality of which Holmes speaks is unalterable and non-negotiable. It cannot be won, it cannot be bought, it cannot be sold. And nor is it a gift that God bestows 
on some who have followed the doctrine of one religion or another and would have us believe that that is the only true path to God. There are many paths up the mountain. Dr. Holmes expresses it like this, and I quote, Spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it you. Spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it you. Can we say that together? Spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it me. Let us say that together. Spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it me. And after Spirit called it you, how dare you call it anything but good? Because to call it anything but good, to call yourself anything but worthwhile and valuable, is to bear false witness against the Creator itself. Don't you dare say that anything that God created is anything less than beautiful because God knows only its own perfection, its own beauty, and its own magnificence and called it you. And so this brings me to your assignment this week. Your mission, should you decide to undertake it, is simply to see God in everyone you encounter this week. And there's a way to practice seeing God. Many of you already use the Sanskrit word namaste, and this is a salute to the God within the other person, as well as a recognition of the God within yourself. So this week, when you look at others, just silently say in your heart, Spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it you. And then just say, Namaste in your heart. Spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it you. Say it every time your eyes make four above the mask with somebody else this week. Say it when you're watching the television and people are perhaps expressing ideas that don't resonate with you. Just say, Spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it you. Namaste. Let us call forth that, that spirit of beauty and perfection and truth that is at the center of every single thing. The stamp of individuality includes the incredible ability bestowed by God upon each of us to determine our experience of life by means of our thought. What a, what a gift that is. This ability resides within our conscious mind, and we can determine what our every experience means and what we can learn from it. The words of one of my favorite songs, The Rose, expresses it perfectly. In that song, the lyrics say, some say love is a river that drowns the tender reed. Some say love it is a razor that leaves your soul to bleed. Some say love it is a hunger, a tender aching need. But there's another view of love that you can decide to hold for yourself and that is this it's so important I say love it is a flower and you it's only seed when you look in the mirror this week my friends and you say spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and call it me say to I am that flower and love within me is the seed that is growing and bearing fruit and blessing the entire world. The science of mind teaches the nature of reality and the vitally important part we play in it. It answers the age-old question, who am I, by revealing to us that we are conscious centers of divine intelligence and as such we have the ability to use our conscious minds to create the life and the experience that we desire and deserve. This divine intelligence that seeks expression in, through, and as us works through a spiritual law that accepts the direct impress of our thoughts 
and acts upon it. As Dr. Holmes puts it, quote, it works for us by working through us and is us always. And then Holmes further explains that this spiritual law works through our subconscious mind. I just want to spend a few moments on this business of the conscious and the subconscious mind. Simply put, this means that conscious mind initiates thought and subconscious mind transforms it into reality. We are not, however, dealing with two separate minds, the conscious and the subconscious, but rather two aspects of one mind, or if you prefer, two sides of one coin. You see, friends, Holmes sometimes calls the subconscious the subjective because it is subject to the dictates of your conscious mind. You dictate to your subconscious, and the subconscious carries out those dictates faithfully to create your experience. So if you're one of those people who says, I'm looking for love, but with my luck, boy. Or as a friend of mine frequently declares, she always says the only really wonderful men are either married or gay. So I give you one guess what her experience has been consistently. When she meets anyone, they're either married or gay or both. To create the experiences you may truly desire, you have to begin thinking the kind of thoughts that creates the consciousness of the desired experience. Let me tell you that you have to begin to consistently think the thoughts that create the desired experience. And it is fortunate that it's not the random thoughts that count, it's those that we consistently hold in mind. It's those that we make a mantra that we, we repeat over and over to ourselves. So we have to be careful what we tell ourselves. There's a wonderful teaching story told by Roman Catholic mystic Father Anthony Dumello in his book, Taking Flight. I've shared it before, but like all good teaching stories, it's really worth repeating. It's a story about a run-down, failing monastery. No new postulants had entered the monastery for years, and the remaining monks were a crabby old lot, always complaining about one another. The abbot was concerned that the monastery would close, so he prayed to God for guidance. One day after praying, he got the idea to visit his old friend, the rabbi, and this he did. And as he poured out his feelings about the troubled monastery and its despondent monks, the two men sat companionably, sipping tea, while the rabbi regarded his friend with a rather puzzled look. But don't you realize that one of you is the Messiah? The abbot's eyes grew round with wonder. What? One of us? The Messiah? But, but, but we are plain, simple men. How could this possibly be? Trust me, my friend, said the rabbi. God works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. So all the way back to the monastery, the abbot turned over the thought in his mind. One of them, the Messiah. Oh my God. Who on earth could it possibly be? Uh, surely not Brother Paul, the slovenly cook. But why not? Doesn't God delight in nourishing his children? Wow, one of us, the Messiah. Absolutely not, Brother Raymond, that silly joker, always acting the fool. But then again, didn't Jesus say that we must become like little children to enter the kingdom of heaven? Hmm. One of us, eh? What about Brother Michael, the gardener, so sullen and taciturn? But then again, maybe he isn't taciturn. After all, he's just caught up in some inner communion with the master. Doesn't he commune with the flowers and animals like St. Francis, the very patron saint of our order? And so on return to the, the, the monastery, the abbot called all the monks together 
and announced that he had shocking news. One of them was the Messiah. He said it with authority. The news jolted everyone, and they began to regard each other with a new respect. Every word and action was regarded as a gift from God. An abundance of love poured forth from the monks through their, their hearts and their eyes and nourished and blessed everything that they looked upon. And in no time, the gardens grew more beautiful and the food became more delicious. People began to show up again for Sunday Mass. And soon, young men began to apply for admission to the order. End of that story. Dr. Wayne Dyer, the late internationally renowned author and speaker, in his presentation on the power of intention, shares this wisdom from Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk and peace activist. Quote, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. When you change the way you look at things, when you change the way you perceive the events of your life, when you change the way you label things, the things that you are looking at change. You see why it's so important that you see God and call forth God from every single person you encounter? Because spirit put the stamp of its individuality on itself and say, are you that? Are you, you know? Everything me think about myself, are you? So hug that up. Know that you are stamped with the imprimatur of the living spirit almighty. You have the stamp of approval and nothing, nothing, my friends, can alter that fact. You are God in perfect expression. To quote Dr. David J. Walker, author of a wonderful book titled, You Are Enough, I quote, the real self is God. When we identify ourselves in this way, we cannot help but meet the world with a confidence that allows us to deal effectively with the changing panorama of life's experiences. Look back over the past year, my dear, of this, my year of, of this pandemic and tell me if we haven't been seeing the changing panorama of life's experiences. And so I want to close using the same metaphor of the auction with which I started in a poem by Myra Brooks Welch titled The Touch of the Master's Hand. T'was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but held it up with a smile. What am I bidden, good folks, he cried. Who will start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, then two, only two, two dollars, and who will make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going, going for three. But no, from the room, far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loose strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as a caroling angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, Now what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars, and who'll make it two? Two thousand, and who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some of them cried, we, we don't quite understand what changed its worth. 
Swift came the reply, the touch of a master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going, and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of a master's hand. My friends, My friends you, you matter, matter because, because you were created, created by the master's, the master's hand. hand. May that, May that hand, hand touch you, touch you today, today as you, as you listen for the still the small, small voice that says, you matter. You matter. You matter because spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it you. And this means that you have been stamped with the approval of the living spirit almighty. One of you, nay, all of you, are the Messiah. Namaste.